Just to be clear, I cannot promise you that after watching this video, you will be the best mixing engineer on the planet or your mixes will sound incredibly amazing, mind-blowing. No, what I can promise you, however, is that if you follow the steps that I will show you, your mixes will not suck. You will not be embarrassed about it. You will not feel ashamed to let someone else listen to your mix. It will be good enough. What do I mean by good enough? I mean that your chances of not getting fired will be higher. Now, mixing, just like any other skill, requires a lot of practice. Nobody is born a sports champion. Nobody is born a race car driver, right? It takes years of practice. First, you'll learn how to press the clutch pedal and shift gear, then press the gas pedal and remove your foot from the clutch slowly. Then after a while, you just drive. You don't think about these steps anymore. And the same goes for mixing. When I'm mixing right now, I don't think about these things. But at first, if you're feeling confused, if you don't really know where to start from or what you should do first, what you should do next, these steps will guide you through it. And also, I made a something for you to practice every step of this process without being overwhelmed by everything, but I'll tell you about it later in the video. But you have to practice. If you don't practice, you will not benefit from anything I say in this video. Let's start from scratch. This is a new scene. There's nothing on it. I have signals coming in, tracks from my computer for the sake of this video. And this is also how you will be practicing. So go to the routing page and assign the inputs to card 1 to 8, card 9 to 16, and so on. So that the channels are getting the signal not from the XLR input, but from the computer. Cool? Okay, step number one is to link the channels that need to be linked before you do anything else. Here I have my drum microphones, and these two right here are the overhead microphones. So above the head of your drummer, you have a microphone on the left side and the microphone on the right side. And this is a stereo signal. It should be considered as one entity, because you'll do the same thing for both. So I'm going to select this and go to the home page right here, and I'm going to link, confirm, and right now, these are a stereo link channel. So whatever I do to this, whatever processing I do to it, EQ, compression, whatever, it will be applied also to the other. And now, one of them is on the left side, and the other is on the right side, you can see in the panning. Cool. And also, of course, name the channels and color code them so you can quickly recognize it just for the sake of organization so you can immediately know what you're looking at and not have to wonder and search for things. So whatever else you have in stereo, like keyboards, electronic piano, pads, whatever stereo signal you have, make sure to link the channels first and also name them and color code them so you know what you're looking at. And the second step is input gain. Now, this is something that a lot of people Overcomplicate. It's really simple. I'm going to say it again. It's really simple. Let's select the acoustic guitar channel for the sake of this example and look at the meters. Okay, what do you see? It seems like it's coming a bit too hot, right? So I'm going to just grab the gain knob, and turn down the gain until it's roughly at minus 18, dancing around the minus 18 mark. Cool. So this, where the green meets the yellow, that's the sweet spot of the preamps on this console. And it doesn't have to be exactly at that point. It doesn't matter. Just don't have it too loud to where it's clipping, it hits, it's hitting the red, nor too low to where it's like down there with the noise. Not too loud, not too quiet, somewhere in the middle. That's it. At this point, you don't even need to listen to your input signals. You can just look at the meters, and as long as it's not clipping, as long as it doesn't hit the red lights, you're fine. You're fine. Okay? And also, I would like to say something about it. The way I like to set the gain is I raise the fader until zero, especially with microphones that tend to feed back or, or that are in a place that has a lot of potential for feedback. I like to put the fader at 0 dB and then adjust the gain from there. And I also like to be able to push the fader up to 10, up to plus 10, and not have everything break down and crash and burn, right? I don't want to be afraid of pushing the fader up. So if I set the gain at like minus 18 or even minus 12, I can still push the fader up all the way and it wouldn't clip. 
I wouldn't have any problem. Next step is to start raising your faders and do a rough mix. Just try to balance it out and see how everything sounds. You don't want anything to be too quiet nor too loud. Just balanced enough and you can hear everything. Nothing is too annoying. Just listen to it, how it sounds. Have a rough balance. Something really important is the polarity of the microphones. Are these channels in polarity? Are they in phase? And by the way, polarity and phase are not the same thing. I explained this in a different video, but I'll just very briefly talk about it right now. Polarity is plus minus, invert the polarity minus plus, right? So we invert the entire signal. So if you have two microphones in, in opposite directions, so you have a snare top microphone and a snare bottom microphone, these two will be out of polarity, so you will have to invert the polarity on one of them and you'll be good. Everything will be good. If you have a microphone inside the kick drum and a microphone outside the kick drum, these are out of time, out of alignment. Okay, And this time delay causes a phase cancellation. So out of phase usually means, not usually, it actually means that the certain frequency is not in time, but also if you move the entire signal altogether out of time, certain frequencies, of course, will not be in time and therefore will cancel each other. So how do you check for that? I have kick in, kick out, select one of them and just hit the polarity switch. Do I have more bass or do I have less bass? If I get, if I hit the polarity switch and all of a sudden the bass is gone, all the bass frequencies are gone, then I was in polarity. I don't need to flip anything. If you have these microphones, or let's say the bass guitar, right? You have a DI and you have an amp. You have them together. Do they feel not bassy enough? Do they feel hollow, like there's no bass at all? They are probably not in phase. So just click the polarity button, and that sometimes will fix it, sometimes not. Maybe you will have to do input delay on the channel to align them measure the delay, but usually, usually, oftentimes, the polarity switch is enough. Next step is panning. Now, your stereo channels are already panned, you don't need to touch them. Since you link them together, they are already on the left and right, like they should, so keep that alone. As for the toms and the panning of the drums, I like to pan it audience perspective, so whatever the audience is looking at, right? So. If you are sitting in the audience looking at the stage, the floor tom will be on your left side, right? So I'm going to pan it to the left. Not all the way, something like 70% maybe. And the rack tom or the high tom will be on your right. So I'll pan it something like 30, 35%. Cool. Okay, now some people like to pan it drummer's perspective. So if you are playing the drums, the floor tom will, will be on your right hand side and the rack tom will be a bit on your left hand side. I like to pan it the way the audience sees it. If you like to do it the way the drummers see it, that's up to you. Okay, it's really personal preference. It doesn't matter. And start panning the rest of the things. So I have a electric guitar right here. I'll push it all the way, or almost all the way to the right, and the acoustic guitar almost all the way to the left, just to make space in the mix so not everything is on top of each other, so I have some space. The kick and snare are always in the middle, the overheads are left and right, the toms, you already panned them, the guitars are to the sides, and the vocal and the bass are in the middle. Cool. And if you have also extra background vocals, you can pan them left and right, left and right, to keep them out of the way of the main vocal. So everything that has power, that is the main focus of the mix, keep it in the middle. And everything that is an accompaniment, everything that helps with the music, push it to the sides to keep it out of the way of the important stuff. Not that the others are not important, but if everything is in the middle on top of each other, it gets very, 
jammed. It gets very stuffed together. Just like you are in, in the middle of a crowd as if you're just pushing them aside so you can stay there comfortably. It's the same with the mix. You're pushing them to the sides so you can have your main focus be there comfortably and be able to hear it without a bunch of other stuff on top of it. Now, the next step is gating. Gating, I already explained gating in a different video, so I'm not going to go over that again in this video to not make it too long. You can click on right here, I guess. You can click right here and watch a tutorial about gating in depth. Gating is really important. If you do it wrong, it sounds bad. If you don't do it at all, you'll have a bunch of bleed. Next step is EQ, and it's also really simple. Remove what's unnecessary and what's ugly first, and then boost what is beautiful. So I'm going to select the EQ right here, first channel, and this is a kick drum. Okay, what is unnecessary? It's the low frequencies below the fundamental. What is the fundamental? It's the lowest note that that instrument can play. Okay, so usually kick drums are between 50 and 60 hertz. So I can comfortably cut at 45 hertz and not affect the sound of the kick drum in any way. I'm just cleaning up the extra low frequencies that may be picked up with the microphone. Cool. Next, I'm going to find the fundamental frequency of that kick drum and boost it a little bit. Okay, I found the fundamental. Now I'm going to find the all the annoying frequencies, the ugly frequencies. With the kick drum, it's usually 400 hertz or 500 hertz. Okay, and also sometimes the octave is the also annoying. The octave is double the frequency, so if this is 400, the octave will be 800. And just boost some top end for the attack to make it more heard, to make it more clear. Cool. Now, I also did a video about EQ. I'll link it up here in the corner somewhere. You can watch it more in depth. I'll not go too much into detail in this video. But let's go through other channels. Um, it's pretty much very similar, similar to the rest of the drums. Overheads don't cut too much. Low frequencies don't go all the way up. The overheads are not just for the cymbals. The overheads are for the entire sound of the drums. Okay, but just cut enough low frequencies so that the kick drum is not interfering with the overheads because it is not in time with the overheads. Okay, there's quite a bit of distance between the overhead microphones and the kick drum microphones. So just get the bass frequencies out of the overhead microphones. And bass, I explained that in the other video. Guitar, guitar, same thing, just cut a bit of low so it doesn't interfere with the bass, boost a bit of highs so it's more clear. Vocals, the vocals, usually, I said it also in another video, 1K is pretty nasally, it's annoying, so you'll most likely cut that. Also, 2K, 3K, a lot of people say it's very important for intelligibility, I don't believe that in my experience, 2 and 3K, even up to 3.5k, it's really pointy, it hurts my ears. Okay, and oftentimes there's too much of it, you don't need to boost any of it. Like, just don't blindly boost frequency because someone told you to boost it, right? So don't just by default go and boost 3k. That's not going to help you. Sometimes I even cut a little bit of it because there's too much of it, right? So always use your ears, please use your ears. Okay, don't take magic numbers. EQ is different for every instrument, different for every person, different for every microphone, for every speaker you're using. Okay, so just listen to it. Does it sound good? Does it hurt my ears? If it hurts my ears, find the frequency that hurts your ears, pull it down. Not all the way, just enough so it's balanced again with the rest of the frequencies. Next step is compression. Compression is really, 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 really important. I cannot stress that enough. 
a lot of people don't compress nearly enough or not at all because they don't know how to compress. And if if there was one magic formula, one secret sauce to mixing, I would say it's compression. Because with a compressor, you can make things louder, which is always better, right? But not all just make things louder. You can make them softer, harder, faster, slower. You can do a lot of things. You can make it come forward, push it back. Compression is really like a, a magic sauce. So I have done a separate video about compression in full detail. It's a very long, detailed video. You can watch it right here and learn how to compress. But just for the sake of this video, with drums, have a slow attack so the compressor doesn't grab it immediately, doesn't grab the transient. So you keep the attack of the drums. The compressor lets go and just grabs the tail of the sound. So you can make it louder, keep it punchy, and make it sustain more. Okay, with vocals, have not a slow attack, but also not a very fast attack because you don't want to kill the the consonants, the k, t, p, s, these sounds. You don't want to entirely kill them, but you don't want them either to be very pointy, right? So a medium attack for the vocals, medium release, not too long, because if the release time is too long, then it it kind of muffles the signal, it kills it. So how do you know if it's too long or not? I'm talking right now. The compressor should release the signal before the next word, right? So it's compress, release, compress, release. Also, if the release time is too quick, then it sounds kind of choppy. It doesn't sound too good. Just compress everything. Bass, compress the bass. If you have a DI, compress the DI very well so that the low frequencies are contained and consistent. And then the top end from the amp will be whatever, will be the tone of the bass. Something I usually like to do is to put the drums on a subgroup and do more processing on the group itself, not just the channels. Now, if you don't have, if you're using all buses for monitors, then fine, don't do that. But if you have two buses available, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the drums, put them right here. So I'm going to select bus one for this example, go to the home page and link it to bus number two. Now this is a stereo pair. Then I'm gonna go to the config page of that bus and say that it's a subgroup. Cool, a subgroup is a post fader bus, which means it's as if you mix normally with the faders and EQ and whatever, and it goes to that subgroup the same way that it goes to the main left and right. So you don't have to worry about sends and whatnot. Cool, now this is a subgroup. I will select it and hit flip fader button. And I will unmute all the drum channels. And by unmuting, I am putting them in the group. That's what it means. I don't need to send anything. Just unmute them so the mixer knows that these channels belong to that group. I'll turn off that button, the flip fader button, and I will put the subgroup on the main left and right, the main stereo. So now this is in the mix. But I have to also make sure to remove the channels themselves from the mix because I don't want them to go twice. That's bad. Okay, so I'm gonna click on all the drum channels and I am gonna remove them from the main mix by turning off the main stereo button. Now, these are not going to the main mix anymore. They are going to that group and that group is going to the main mix. Cool, and now on that bus, I can go to the compressor, turn it on, and I can do more compression on the drum bus to make it sound better in the mix. So whatever EQ and compression I do on the channels themselves with anything, not just drums, whatever I do on the channel is to make it not suck, to make it sound good enough. And whatever I do on a group is to make it sound good in the mix. Cool? So don't. it's not like I do this this much here and this much here, it's separate. This is to make it not suck. This is to make it sound good inside the mix.
Next step is to take care of the main vocal a bit more. Right now it's too sibilant, it hurts my ears, it's too pointy, and it's also inconsistent. The low mids are coming in and out of the signal. So to fix that, I'll use a multiband compressor, which is called the Combinator Effect. I have done a separate video about that on how to use it. I'll link it up here, you can watch it. But basically what I'm doing is I'm using this as a de-esser, to, to tame the high end and stop the S's and T's from burning my ears. And I'm also controlling the low mids with it and using it kind of like an EQ, but not really. And I'm also using the spectral balance control on this. So if I put the meters right here, not these meters, but these meters, you can see that it goes up and down right here. So this balances the, the frequency ranges, so it's more consistent. This really helps, by the way. I really encourage you to watch that video and learn how to use it, because it's kind of like magic. Don't use it on your Megan mix, however. Just use it on individual channels. Okay, using it on an entire group is a bad idea. You can do that. You can do it, but I don't advise doing it. Okay, so use it on individual channels to fix individual problems. Right now, that's good enough. You can work with that. It's totally okay. It's totally enough. But you can do a bit more. You can use effects to bring it the whole mix to life a bit more, to make it a bit more spacious, to make it a bit fuller. Effects are not that complicated. Just go to that effects page, select the bus. These four buses at the end are effect sends. So whatever you send to these buses will get into the effect and it will return on these effect returns, okay? These effect returns are channels, not buses. So the channel goes in here, from here it goes into the effect, from the effect it goes back into the mix through these channels. Cool, how do you send a channel to an effect? You select the effect bus, flip fader, and you send that channel to it. Okay, I like to use the, either the, this vintage room or a plate, for the vocals, so the um, lexicon model. Hall reverb is good also. Plate, rich plate. But you'll also do some processing on those. It's not, the effect alone is not enough. I like to use the vintage reverb, this one, on drums. It sounds really nice. And the stereo tube stage, this is distortion, if you noticed. And I'm using it uh, for the sake of thickening up the mix. I have also a different video about that. I explained it. I'll link it up here. You can watch it. But basically, basically, with the effects, you're going to also either EQ or compress the effects, the effect bus itself. You're going to compress it. Or you're, or, and or you're going to also EQ the effect returns. Cool, so something like that. You'll do something like that. Compressing the sends bus sometimes is good, sometimes it doesn't really matter, but EQing the effect returns is always really important. Never just keep it as it is, because effects in general and reverbs and delays have very bright, uh, like very bright top end, like it's really distracting. It draws too much attention to the effect, and you don't want that in the mix. The attention should be on the vocal, on the main vocal, not on the effect. The effect is just to help it out, right? To just push it more forward, not to take the spotlight. So just cut the top frequencies and the bottom frequencies so the effect return is in the mid range. Because the mid-range inside the mix, you can't really hear it. It doesn't drag your ear, oh, I'm there, but you feel it. If you mute it, you'll notice that it doesn't exist, that it's not there. But if it's unmuted, if it's there, it will just improve the mix. If you're cutting the high and low end, it will not draw too much attention to itself. You may want to EQ your main left and right, 
just some boom and fizz, which means just some extra bass and just some extra top end to make it more beautiful. Yes, I am doing a low cut on the main left and right. You may find that strange, but let me tell you something. Low frequencies have a lot of energy. They take too much headroom, right? And in a live environment with live instruments, not electronic music, not sub frequencies, live instruments, the biggest kick drum will have a fundamental of 40 hertz. You won't have anything that is lower than 40 hertz. There's no point of having these frequencies. It's unnecessary. So I'm right here cutting at 35 hertz to clean up my mix. And if I remove those unnecessary frequencies, I'll make the mix seem louder, even if it's not actually louder on the meters, it will feel louder. And if you want, if you're a bass head and you like a lot of bass, just turn up the level of your, your subwoofers. Don't do it in the mix. Keep your mix clean because too much bass frequencies inside the mix will clutter it up and doesn't help. Just turn up the level of your subwoofers if you like a lot of bass. The last step would be a limiter. I always use a limiter on my main left and right. I'll tell you why, but let me show you first. So I'm gonna go to this effect right here, and I'm gonna select the precision limiter. Okay, I skipped it. This is the precision limiter. I'll select it, and I will put it on the main left right. So go all the way up to left slash right. And this is now on my main left right. I'll click edit. I'll first insert it. This is really important. Don't forget that because if you don't turn on the insert, even if it's on the main left and right, it will not be in the signal chain. So make sure to insert it to turn on the insert. Then edit. I will, first of all, I will turn down the output gain to minus one dB and I will turn up the input gain until I get start getting some limiting, okay? It shouldn't be all the time. This shouldn't be squishing the mix all the time, sucking the life out of it, no. It's just to make it louder, make the mix louder, and chop off some of the transients that are not necessary, not very important, okay? And make it overall louder, that's it. You can play around with the squeeze and the knee if you want. The attack, I like to make it a bit slower, just a bit, maybe 0.07, and release a bit quicker. So maybe like 70, 80. Living in harmony, die in this harmony, never lose this part of me. Oh, but somebody told me that uh, you shouldn't use a limiter on your main left and right, it's bad. Why is it bad? Why? That I, I literally cannot think of one reason why using a limiter is bad. First of all, what is a limiter? A limiter is a compressor. It's a compressor with a very high ratio. Okay, what did I tell you earlier in the video? Compression is the magic sauce. Why would you not use a limiter? People who say that is because they don't know how to use a limiter and they probably used it one time and they used it wrong and it made the mix sound worse. Because yes, if the attack time is extremely fast and you're smashing the life out of your mix and the release time is really slow, so it's always grabbing it all the time, it's not letting go, yeah, it will sound awful. Then yeah, it's bad, don't use a limiter. But otherwise, if the attack time is not too quick, and if the release time is fast enough to where it's letting go of the signal when it should let go of the signal, and the input gain or a threshold, whatever you want to call it, the amount of limiting is not too much. Just on the very loud part, it's attenuating a little bit. It's amazing. It's amazing. Don't just try things out. Use your ears. That's my whole point with everything. Use your ears. Don't just, even what I'm saying, don't just take it for granted because someone on the internet told you to do something, then it must be right. It may not be right for you. Use your ears. Do you like it? Do you like how it sounds? Good. Do you not like how it sounds? Do it differently. If you remember in the beginning of the video, I told you that I have something for you to practice mixing. 
For every one of the steps that I showed you in this video, I saved it as a scene that you can download from the link in the description below. And there's also another link within that folder to download the multitracks to actually practice with the same stuff that I was using. Okay, so download the multitracks, download all the scenes for the different steps, and you can practice each step independently from the others without feeling overwhelmed from doing the entire mix all at once. So you can just go one step at a time and practice, practice, practice. Because if you don't practice, if you just know it in your head, it doesn't matter. You will not benefit from it. Okay, practice as much as you can. That's what I can do for you. That's it. If you like the video, like the video and click right here for another video that YouTube thinks is best for you. And also all the videos that I mentioned in this video for all the steps, the tutorials that are in detail are also in the description. So yeah, I'll see you in the next one.